Hi everyone, it's Carrie Fridley, and today we're going to look at Module 12, Jazz Fusion Part 1. Popular music in the late 1960s. Beginning at the end of the Second World War, jazz ended its reign as America's popular music. The airwaves of the late 1940s to the present day have been dominated by a plethora of musical styles, with jazz only occasionally reaching the same level of mass appeal as other genres. The isolated examples were notable. The crooners of the early 1950s we learn about in Module 9 whose distinct voices and personalities came across in the popular songs they interpreted. Dave Brubeck and his quartet topped the charts with long improvisational forays in odd musical meters, an approach atypical in the landscape of popular music. Louis Armstrong knocked the Beatles from their throne at the top of the Billboard charts in January 1964, a position they held for 14 consecutive weeks with his timeless rendition of Hello Dolly. And who can forget the endearing combination of Charles Schultz's timeless classic, A Charlie Brown Christmas, inseparably tied to the heartwarming and colorful soundtrack by jazz pianist Vince Guaraldi. For the most part, however, jazz was an underground art form. By the late 1960s, rock and roll, Motown, folk music, country music, and various forms of R&B were the focus of the American public and the American music industry. Jazz musicians had experimented with the fusion of jazz and these popular styles since the early 1950s, as we saw with Horace Silver's fusion of gospel, R&B, and jazz with hard bop, and Cal Jader's incorporation of Latin American dance music in a bop context. However, jazz musicians had been hesitant until the late 1960s to wholeheartedly embrace the new soundscapes established by a new rebellious generation of young musicians. The jolting wails of the electric guitar, the relentless ostinato of driving fender bass lines, drumming which emphasized energy and pulse over rhythmic sophistication, and melodies which were at times so simple they were subservient to the lyrics. Similar to jazz music, there were innovations in rock and R&B. Many notable musicians pushed the limits of what was musically possible with their artistic innovations and unprecedented vision of what music could be. Jimi Hendrix created new soundscapes never before imagined with his electric guitar. The Beatles wrote some of the most harmonically, melodically, and rhythmically sophisticated popular music of the day, incorporating everything from string quartets to the Carnatic tradition of classical Indian music in their groundbreaking albums. Sly and the Family Stone forged a new sound, all while writing songs on important political and social issues. And James Brown, the godfather of soul, set the foundations for what would become funk music. In light of these new directions in popular music, Miles Davis began to change his sound to a more contemporary aesthetic. 
This artistic decision would provide one of the most divisive arguments in jazz music since the birth of bebop. Many musicians, including those who even collaborated with Davis during this period, were confounded, annoyed, and in some cases, even appalled by the jazz giant's decision to turn his back on the bop tradition and forge a new sound which fused jazz, America's musical institution, with rock music, the symbol of rebellion against anything institutional in American culture. Like Bob Dylan, Miles's decision to go electric resulted in the loss of his most devout fans. Also like Dylan, Davis began to receive criticism that he was selling out, abandoning his musical roots to pursue a more lucrative career. The incentive for Miles' decision is still and will likely always be a mystery. But one thing is certain, when Miles Davis went electric, jazz music experienced an enormous change. In your textbook, there are video links to Miles Electric, A Different Kind of Blue, his first electric album, so be sure to watch that video in your textbook. Fusion develops as a jazz genre. The influence of Miles Davis's electric shift was felt by the jazz world. And in the early 1970s, several artists, many of whom had played in Miles's electric ensemble, would go on to start their own electric projects. Perhaps one of the most influential and commercially successful groups was Weather Report a group formed by Miles Davis's alumni Wayne Shorter and Cannonball Adderley's pianist Yosef Zawinul. Zawinul, an Austrian-born pianist, left his homeland in 1959 on a full scholarship to study jazz in America. In the 1960s, he played with Cannonball Adderley's Quintet, a hard bop group which also incorporated contemporary R&B and Motown into a jazz combo setting. Zawinul's composition, Mercy, 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 became an anthem for the civil rights movement which initially seems ironic considering Zawinul's Austrian heritage. However, Zawinul, born into poverty and having witnessed the forceful removal of minorities during the Third Reich, related to the difficulties facing African Americans who were marginalized and segregated in white America. Zawinul's band leader, Adderley, introduced a live performance of the keyboardist's piece by saying, Sometimes we don't know just what to do when adversity takes over. And I have advice for all of us. I got it from my pianist, Joe Zawinul, who wrote this tune, and it sounds like what you are supposed to say when you have that kind of problem. Be sure to listen to Mercy, Mercy, Mercy by Joseph Zawinall with Cannon Adderley, Cannonball Adderley Quintet. The link is provided in your textbook. Following his stint with the Cannonball Adderley Quintet, Zawinul recorded another one of his compositions in a silent way with Miles Davis. In his self-titled autobiography, Miles often cites the birth of jazz fusion 
as the recording of this composition. I had called Joe Zawinul and told him to bring some music to the studio because I loved his compositions. He brought a tune called In a Silent Way, and it became the album's title tune. We changed what Joe had written on In a Silent Way, cut down all the chords and took his melody and used that. I wanted to make the sound more like rock music. So listen to In a Silent Way by Miles Davis and Joseph Zawinul. The link is provided in your textbook. It was during this period with Miles that Zawinul met Wayne Shorter. As you may recall from Module 11, Shorter, a prolific composer and hugely influential saxophonist, had already established himself as one of the most significant jazz artists of his day. Having worked with the second quintet, Miles' electric band, and as a band leader for several Blue Note records, when Zawinul and Shorter created Weather Report, they hoped to continue the fusion tradition Miles had forged at the close of the 1960s, utilizing electric instruments to create new soundscapes. Another core component of Weather Report's aesthetic was a focus on mutual improvisation. According to Zawinul, this new ensemble was one where the musicians always solo and never solo. One can hear this concept of collective creativity in the live performance from 1971, Seventh Arrow. There's a listening link in your textbook. Please note that the track listed for the video link is actually Seventh Arrow not waterfall, as was indicated. Weather Report would go on to gain greater commercial success as the 1970s progressed, culminating in their major hit, Birdland, a composition by Zawinul dedicated to the New York City Jazz Club named after Charlie Parker. Birdland represents a more refined, commercially accessible sound with multiple synthesizer overdubs and a hypnotic beat referencing the popular disco rhythm of the late 1970s. However, Weather Report's original concept of collective improvisation is still intact with Zawinul, Shorter, and Jocko Pastorius, all providing improvised solos and riffs of the highest order. Pastorius was especially influential, bringing the electric bass to the forefront as a jazz instrument. His use of extended techniques such as feedback and harmonics made him a superstar of the jazz electric bass. More importantly, Jocko possessed incomparable technique on the instrument and was the first jazz artist to extensively feature the bass as a lead melodic voice within the ensemble. Be sure to listen to Birdland by Weather Report. There's a link provided in your textbook. Birdland has since become one of the most popular modern jazz pieces, having been covered by trumpet virtuoso Maynard Ferguson and jazz vocal quartet Manhattan Transfer. Weather Report also embodied a global approach to its sound, with Zawinul and Shorter incorporating the sounds, instruments, rhythms, and musical concepts 
of various indigenous cultures into their electric ensemble. The fusion of the old and new was often reflected in the percussionists they hired, who hailed from South America and Africa at different points in the band's 15-year career. In their 1976 lineup, Weather Report consisted of Puerto Rican percussionist Manolo Badrena and Peruvian drummer Alex Acuna performing with Pastorius, Shorter, and Salanol. It is a wonderful example of musicians from three different continents combining their shared musical and cultural experiences to create a distinctly global sound. But Weather Report was only one of many groups to incorporate other cultures' musical traditions into their overall sound. Several other ensembles assimilated other musical traditions in the context of jazz fusion. Pianist and composer Chick Corea is one of these artists. Korea is a prolific modern jazz artist, having written compositions in a variety of contexts, including solo piano, acoustic piano trio, and duo settings. But his most commercially successful work was in the jazz fusion genre, notably with his band Return to Forever. The band had two distinct periods, the first focusing on Brazilian music, followed by a period where funk and rock music were combined to form a distinctly heavy sound. Return to Forever's first album, Light as a Feather, epitomized the ecumenical approach of jazz fusion, seamlessly combining Brazilian samba Spanish classical music, and R&B. The album's closing track, Spain, is actually Chick Corea's interpretation of Concerto de Aranjuez, a classical work for solo guitar and orchestra by 20th century Spanish composer Joaquin Rodrigo. Brazilian percussionist Erto Moreira provides a myriad of percussive textures on the recording, a sublime accompaniment to the haunting vocals of his wife, Flora Purim. Be sure to listen to Spain from Return to Forever by Chick Corea. There's a link listed in your textbook. The second period featured a tightly knit trio, predominantly featuring the three primary instruments of rock music, respectively the electric guitar, played by Al Demiola, the electric bass, played by Stanley Clark, and the drums, played by Lenny White. Chick Corea, seen here on the right, expanded his sonic palette beyond the electric Fender Rhodes piano he had used on Light as a Feather, adding various synthesizers to the group's sound. Corea's Spanish ancestry continues to figure prominently in his new configuration. The opening solo of the performance of Space Circus evokes the harmonic structure of flamenco music. So listen to Return to Forever, the band shown here, headed up by Chick Corea. As they play Space Circus, there is a link provided in your textbook.
Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time when we look at Module 12, Jazz Fusion, Part 2.